Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Pray First, the conversation we have Monday through Friday right here on the Pastor Doug page. It's good to be with you guys. Hashtag live if you're joining us live. Hashtag recorded if you're joining recorded. Hashtag shared to get this out of your page. Everybody, we're going to be talking about something today that I've been uh, avoiding talking about, um, and no particular reason. I just feel like, you know, I don't need to change the subject on teaching the Word of God. The Word of God has been uh, changing the situations forever. So, I don't like to respond backwards. I like to respond forwards. So we're going to talk about shelter in place today, but we're going to talk about it from a different aspect. You know, shelter in place is a term that we're using uh, that none of us knew uh, just a month or two ago. And it defines how we interact, how we live, how we work, how we play, how we interact, how we socialize, how we communicate uh, during a time of a national uh, and state-by-state a restricted quarantine. So we're going to talk about the term, but I'm not going to talk about uh, it in the way that maybe you think I'm talking about it. So everybody hashtag shelter. And if you want to, you can write hashtag shelter and in place. Everybody hit the hearts, hit the lights, go crazy on those and let everybody know that you are glad that they have joined us here at Pray First. This is for all of you first time guests, all you first time viewers. Uh, people are beginning to sleep in a little bit longer on the uh, days of the week. How many of you guys are working hashtag work? How many of you guys are off, hashtag off? How many of you guys are, let's see, what's the way I want to put this? How many of you guys are off right now who would normally be working? If you're off right now, but you would normally be working, I'm not talking about retired or working from home. How many of you are away from your job, you would normally be working? I want you to hashtag normally, just the word normally. You're at home, but you would normally uh, be at work. Come on, let's hit those hashtags out there. What's up, what's up? Hashtag yep, yep. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 46, verse 1 and 2 today as we talk about shelter in place. I want to help you uh, to place your focus in the right area. Some of you are dealing with stress, tension, fear, anxiety, and it is fueling your depression your addiction, and your emotions. I want to help you refocus. I want to help you take your attention, your gaze, your focus away from the loud noises, away from the dark, fearful places, and to place your focus back on the rock, on the light, on on, on the power, on the strength. I want to bring you today back to a spot where maybe you've never been in your walk with God and how you say, Doug, how are you going to bring us back to a spot we've never been? Well, God has a special place for you and it's there whether you visit it frequently or not. I want to say this again. God has a special place for you that is always there, whether you visit or visit it or not, a special garden, a special haven, a special table, a special rock, a special place hewn out in the midst of enemies, in the midst of storms. There is a special place that God has for his children that exists, whether you visit it or not. And I want to help you relocate it, find it, and take shelter there in that place. Everybody, hashtag shelter is in place. There is a shelter in place for you. What do you do? How do you respond when bad news comes? How do you respond when your life changes? How do you respond when you lose someone who's close to you to death or you lose someone who's close to you uh, through divorce or uh, you know, separation? Uh, how, how do you respond when your financial situation changes? How, how do you respond when you get a medical diagnosis that does not look promising? How do you respond when the loud bang happens and, and you are afraid and you are lonely and you are scared and you are hurting and maybe in physical pain? How do you respond? I just, I just need you to know there is a shelter in place for God's children that has always been available even if you haven't visited it ever or you haven't visited it lately or you did not know it existed. What is your refuge 
when you're under attack. The definition of refuge is an elevated fortress. When, when the waters began to rise, what is your place that is higher than you? I know you know the song, Lord, lead me to that rock. Lord, lead me to that rock that is higher than I. Oh, lead me to that rock. Oh, Lord, higher than I. Lead me to, you know, I know you know the, the four or five part harmony to lead me to that rock that's higher and that you can sing it. But I just want to encourage you that there is a fortress that will not only... Um, will not only medicate your feelings, but will inform your decision-making. That's a very important statement. A lot of us look for something to uh, help soothe and calm our feelings, but this shelter in place, God is not as interested in uh, causing you to feel happier or feel less tension or feel less anxiety or feel more free or feel more relieved. God is not as interested in, in solving or calming your feelings as he is in forming your decisions. What is your refuge when you're under attack? What is that refuge that is an elevated fortress for you? A fortress is a place where you go when you're being attacked. Well, what, is that, what is that for you? Uh, a fortress, a habitation, the scripture refers to it as a fortress, a habitation, a rock, a higher place, a higher spot, a place of safety. Psalm chapter 46, verse 1 and 2. God is our refuge. Hashtag refuge. Now this is going to sound candy wrapper, refrigerator magnet, versed crap. But I want you to get past the candy wrapper, refrigerator versed crap and not trying to just soothe or balm your soul, but inform your decisions. You're making decisions right now based on some pretty incomplete uh, information. Uh, you're basing some of your decisions on just what's happening now with disregard to that your today is connected to yesterday and your yesterday will show up in your tomorrow, you've got to remember uh, that uh, you need to be praying that God will give you a glimpse of eternity and time. Come on, come on. Lord, teach us to number our days and that the 1 through 15 days are connected to the 16 through 30 days. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Not a heart that is necessarily satisfied with the circumstances. Not a heart that is at rest or necessarily at peace uh, in the form of there's no waves or there's no storm or there's no dark clouds. But Lord, inform me that I'm numbering my days to gain a heart of wisdom so that my refuge will inform my decision-making process. Look, right now is when you should be sowing. And you should be sowing in abundance. Now is not the time to consume your seed. It's the springtime. And when the harvest comes, make sure there is something in the soil. Now is not the time to, to, to back away. It's time to push forward. Now is not the time to turn inward. It's time to turn outward. It's time to do the opposite of everything you feel like doing. Now is not the time to disconnect. Now is the time to connect. Woo. God is our refuge and strength. He's not just a refuge. He is our fuel behind our engine. He is the spark behind the fire. He is the heat behind the flame. He is the energy behind the electrical uh, uh, pulses of our spirit and our soul. God is not only our refuge, he is our battery. He, we, he is our fuel. He is our power. He is our ability. God is not just a place we run to so we feel better. God is someone that we go to when we want to do better. Be better, act better, have better decision-making processes. Have someone inside of us who can tell us not of what's going on right now, but what's coming so that we make the right decisions today. Scripture says God is our refuge and strength, not just our refuge. A very present help in time of trouble. 
Therefore, we will not fear. Hashtag no fear. Even if you feel it. Look, we've got to uh, get past this, I'm, I feel afraid, and I feel lonely, and I feel isolated, and I feel you have got to stop basing your decisions on a feeling. More than a feeling. Woo! When I, never mind, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, there's got to be something in you deeper than your surface level fears, isolations, loneliness, concern, anxiety, worry, stress that drives you from the inside that does not mean an absence of fear, but means that there is a progress, there is a, a, a decision to be made, there is something to do in spite of the feeling of fear. That I'm not going to let fear be a factor in my life. Fear is present. Fear is felt. Fear is here. There's reason to fear, but it is not a factor in how I determine how I'm going to live. God is very present help. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. The psalmist writes, since God has become my refuge, it doesn't say I have no fear. It says I will not fear. That's important. You say you can't choose fear. What? You absolutely choose fear. You choose fear in as much as it is a factor in your decision-making process. This is so important that you listen to me. This is so important that you hear me. This is so important that it's not a refrigerator. It's not a feeling. It's not a, oh, I just feel so much better since Pastor Doug talked. I don't give a flying Easter bunny if you feel better because I talked. I want you to make decisions based on the truth and the principles of God and not the circumstances or the feelings in your life. I want you to learn to fly your plane, the plane of your life, in the clouds. I want you to learn that you don't have to see what's in front of you to take a step. I want you to learn to become instrument-oriented and not just visual. I want you to be able to look at the dashboard of God's Word and determine where you are and where you're going, and not every time you fly into a cloud, you freak out because you cannot see how you're going to make it. You cannot see how this is going to work. You cannot see how you're going to make ends meet. You cannot see how you're going to survive. You cannot see how they're going to get through this. It does not matter what you see when you understand the gauges and you are dashboard certified in the truth of God's Word. You may be looking at the horizon and crashing your plane because of the disorientation of, of what's going on in your, your reality, in what you perceive to be truth, and, and, and overcorrect or undercorrect based on a, a decision-making process and factor of fear. Since God has become my refuge, the psalmist says, even if the mountains jump in the ocean, or even if the earth begins to dissolve under my feet, I'm not going to be afraid. You can have fear and not be afraid. You can sense fear and walk in courage. You can sense fear and walk in victory. You can sense fear and lack and, and, and a less than mentality and charge the gates of hell with it. There's a difference in feeling fear and being afraid. Afraid means fear has stopped you, frozen you, and rendered you incapable of doing what you need to do. Woo! How do you handle fear? How do you handle fear? How do, how do you handle fear, anxiety, and worry? Some of you can't sleep. Some, some of you can't pray. So some of you can't uh, make a decision, can't, can't invest in the kingdom, invest in people around you. You can't be generous because you never created margin in your life. You just flew when the sun shines and the bird sings. But as soon as the sun gets hidden behind the clouds and the birds find refuge in the trees, you lock up like a pickup truck running on water. Do you hear me? 
Have you, has your life ever locked up like a pickup truck on water? It's because God is not your refuge and strength. There's something you're running to. There's something that fuels you. But for most Christians, and if your definition of Christian is just follower of Christ, and that's not how you respond, and that's how, not how you make decisions, you will lock up because you're running on a different kind of power. You're, you're burning cheap fuel. There's water in your tank. How do you respond to stress, worrying, anxiety? I heard this morning about a deer farmer who had fenced in five acres of his land with a very high fence so that the coyotes of Texas couldn't get to his baby deer, and he had five baby fawns. He went out into his fields, and he looked, and one of his fawns was dead. And he thought, I wonder what got that. It couldn't have been a coyote. I keep this place so secure, so sealed. The vet come out and checked it. He wanted to make sure there was no diseases in his pastures or no diseases in his little farm fields and in his trees or in the other deer. And the vet determined that the deer died of anxiety and stress. The, the, fear, the deer died uh, because something had been chasing him. Uh, the deer was faster than whatever was chasing him. But as fear and anxiety set in, the capillaries in his body began to burst, rendering that deer immobile. Have you ever heard the phrase frozen in fear? Though the capacity was there, though the energy was there, so though the potential was there, so the ability was there for that deer to outrun or get away from or go to a place of safety and shelter, escape the snare of the devourer, if you will, fear froze them. Fear froze this little deer, and he, he died of stress. He died of anxiety. He died because he was rendered immobile. Now, I need to hurry up and finish this off so you can go do whatever it is you're doing today. But don't miss these last statements. Fear is not a good factor in decision-making. Fear will tell you to stop when you need to run. Fear will tell you to run when you should stop. Fear is not a good factor in decision-making because fear is a liar. I know you sing about it. I know, I know you have a little K-Love song that you sing about. But until these K-Love songs, these refrigerator magnets, uh, begin to affect your decision-making process and not just soothe your soul so you feel better. You see, the goal of most of us is just to escape this fear feeling. The goal of many of us is just uh, get to a place where I don't have to feel this anymore. Courage is acting though fear is present. I am not afraid. I feel fear. Oh, don't get me wrong, but I am not afraid. And I'm not going to base my next decision on fear. No more than I'm going to let money make decisions for me. I make decisions for money. I am not a worshiper of mammon. I am a worshiper of God. My refuge and my strength is not in an idol, is not in a evil spirit, mammon, fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question today? Of all the factors in decision-making, I'm going to say this statement when I ask you a question. Of all the factors in decision-making, fear should be ignored. Now, here's my question. How is it, how is it that you will take advice from a spirit that God did not send? I want, you, I want you to focus on that. I want you to focus on that question. How is it that you, a follower of Christ, is going to take advice from a spirit God did not send? No, I'm waiting on an answer. How is it that you're going to allow fear to be a factor? How is it that you're going to take fear's advice? How is it that you're going to take a feeling that God didn't send, a spirit that God... How are you going to take advice from a demon? How is it that you're comfortable making decisions based on the lies of a demon rather than the truth of God's word? I'll tell you why. Because you got a refrigerator magnet faith. You got a more music, can love. What? Are you just trying to soothe your soul? 
Are you just trying to get your mind, your will, and emotions to line up with peace? There's a peace that surpasses understanding. Peace that surpasses understanding means that two plus two is no longer four, but there's peace to make a decision to say, yeah, it is. Peace that surpasses understanding is doing something when you don't feel like it. It does not add up. It does not seem right. It does not look right. And there's something inside of me telling me, hell no, hell no, hell no. But something is telling me, yes, yes, yes. I'm going to ask you one more time. How is it that you, a follower of Christ, justify taking advice from a spirit God didn't send, and that's the spirit of fear. Everybody needs a refuge. Everybody has one. It just might not be the right one. That little deer took refuge in freezing, and he was consumed. What's your refuge? Is it money? Did God rescue you with a stimulus check? <laughs> or did he just pacify your latest mammon worship? Is it food? I'm hearing there's something called the uh, COVID-15. That's where you gain 15 pounds because you're stress eating. Is it medication? Maybe it's alcohol, drugs, sex. Maybe it's your spouse. You're disappointed in your spouse right now because they're your refuge and your strength, and they're not living up to what you, uh, what you need, and they're disappointing you. Is it your government? I can't tell you how many times I look at Twitter and Facebook and social media and see how many people are running to the government to suck the teat of taxes and and, and, and crap, as if, as if they've ever been the solution. Is it, is it your spouse? Is it ch your children? Come on. Is it open spaces? I want you to know some people are just going outside and finding solitude for their soul. Sunshine on your face. Hmm, nature. Escape the feeling. Be careful what you replace God's refuge with. Be careful what you make an idol out of. God does not play well with idols. I'm not saying you shouldn't go get sun. I'm not saying you shouldn't get out in nature. I'm not saying you shouldn't go walk. I'm not saying you should breathe, but be careful what you're doing. Return to the word, return to prayer. Return to worship. Return to worshiping right things. Return to making decisions that are not based on input, are not based on advice from a spirit that didn't come from God, which is fear. I want to implore you to turn your focus today intentionally towards Jesus. Establish a prayer life, a devotional life, a reading of scripture life. Not a church attendance life, not a church attendance life, but I am the church life. I want you to reintroduce yourself to practicing the presence of God. I want you to reintroduce yourself to, come here, come here, come here, hosting the presence of God. He's around you. Make sure you're serving Him. And then, you will recline at the table set in the midst of your enemies. And then you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You will fear no evil. I can't implore you enough to express your love to God. And be very careful what you replace his presence with. And what you soothe and medicate your soul with. Because you don't want your soul in control of you. Your soul will try to kill your body and quiet your spirit. Snap out of it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that they snap out of it. That their mind, their will, and their emotions will not be, will not be what leads them. But they will be led by the Spirit of God. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these 
are the children of God. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I love y'all dearly. I'll see you back later. Hashtag live, hashtag recorded, hashtag shared. Hit the hearts, hit the lights. Go stupid on those. It's Monday morning. Make a decision today. I will not take advice from a spirit God didn't send me and then do something about it. In spite of, not in lieu of, how you feel. Bye, guys. I love y'all.